To this point in the course, we've seen that the Gospels contain stories that didn't happen, or at least that didn't happen as they're told. Evidence resides in the stories themselves. Sometimes there are clear discrepancies among the surviving accounts, for example, as to the day and hour of Jesus' crucifixion in Mark and John. And sometimes the accounts are so highly implausible that historians are fairly unified in agreeing that they cannot have happened as narrated. For example, the worldwide census in Luke. We now need to move to the next step of trying to understand why the Gospels are this way. Who wrote these accounts? And where did they get their information? The titles of the Gospels name their authors as two of the disciples, Matthew, the tax collector, and John, the son of Zebedee, and two friends of the Apostles, Mark, the secretary of the Apostle Peter, and Luke, the traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. Scholars, though, have reasons to doubt these traditional ascriptions. The titles of the Gospels were not originally put there by their actual authors. As I've mentioned, all of the accounts were anonymous. The titles appear to have been added later. This should be clear simply on the basis of a, mo of a moment's reflection. If someone named Matthew actually wrote a book about Jesus' words and deeds, he surely would not have called it the Gospel according to Matthew. He would have called it something like the Gospel of Jesus Christ, or the life and death of our Savior, or something of the sort. Whoever labels it the Gospel according to Matthew is trying to explain whose version of Jesus' story this one is. So too with the other Gospels. Moreover, we know that the original manuscripts of the Gospels did not have their authors' names attached to them. Even more significantly, none of our Gospels claims to be written by an eyewitness. For example, even though there's a person who's called Matthew in Matthew's Gospel, the author gives no indication that he himself is that person. Matthew is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9. This is the story of Jesus uh, calling one of his disciples, and the, story, the text simply says, As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. The account is narrated completely in the third person. Traditionally, though, People have maintained that this is referring to the author himself. Why? Well, because in a similar story in Mark's gospel, Mark being the source for the gospel of Matthew, this person isn't called Matthew, but is called Levi. Well, the question then is, why would this author change the name of, uh, of the person uh, who's the tax collector that Jesus called? And the uh, logic is that he would have uh, named himself after his preferred name, Matthew, rather than his other name, Levi. It seems like a somewhat tenuous evidence to go on, though, given the circumstance that the author says nothing in the account to indicate that he's talking about himself. Moreover, throughout his account, the author never indicates that he was personally involved in any of the events that he describes. At no point, for example, does the author say anything like, then Jesus said to me, or then I said to Simon, or any such thing? Uh, the author gives his entire account in the third person, talking about other people, giving no indication that he himself was involved. The same is true of the other Gospels as well. The one possible exception is the fourth Gospel, which ends with a passage that readers have sometimes taken to be a self-claim by the author that he was a personal observer of the events that he narrates. The account comes in John chapter 21, verse 24, when after uh, Jesus has been raised from the dead and then appeared to his uh, disciples, 
uh, the author says, chapter 21, verse 24, this is the disciple, referring to the person just referred to in a previous story, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. People since the second century have uh, believed that this is referring to the author himself who is testifying these things and who has written them. But even when you read this verse carefully, it's clear that the author is not talking about himself because of what he says at the end of the verse. We believe that or we know that his testimony is true. In other words, the author here speaks in the first person knowing about what somebody else has written. This author is claiming not to be an eyewitness of the things that Jesus said and did. He's claiming to have based his account on the report of an eyewitness, which, of course, is a huge difference. In sum, the New Testament Gospels were written anonymously. The authors did not attach their names to their work. Possibly they thought their own names were relatively unimportant. It appears that the earliest readers of the Gospels also found that their authors' names were unimportant. Interestingly, nobody who quotes these books or even alludes to them ever mentions their authors' names during the first half century that they were in circulation. In other words, whenever anybody quotes or alludes to one of these books, they never say who, uh, whom the books were written by. The first time we have any inkling at all that a Christian knew or cared about who wrote these books come from about uh, 120 to 130 A.D. in the writings of an obscure author named Papias. Unfortunately, we don't have all of Papias' writings themselves. What we have are citations of his writings in later authors. In two fragments of Papias' writings, it appears that Papias claimed that two of the Gospels were written by apostles. Specifically, Papias claimed that the Apostle Peter, on his missionary endeavors, would speak about Jesus' words and deeds as the occasion demanded, uh, that he didn't give his uh, talks about what Jesus said and did from beginning to end, but that uh, whatever the occasion was, he, he said something that Jesus had said and done. Moreover, Papias indicates that Peter's secretary, Mark, later wrote the stories down, but, quoting Papias, not in order, end quote. Papias said that he received this information about Mark from an elderly Christian that he knew. In addition, Papias claimed that the apostle Matthew wrote the sayings of Jesus in Hebrew and that, quote, Everyone interpreted them as they could, end quote. Papias says nothing about uh, either Luke or John. This tradition from Papias needs to be considered seriously. It appears that his comments about Mark refer to the Mark that we have in the New Testament, although there's no way to know for sure since Papias doesn't actually quote the book, but it appears that he's talking about the book of Mark that we ourselves know of. What he says about Mark, though, is somewhat puzzling. It's striking that he emphasizes that the author of this gospel was not an eyewitness, that he based his account on stories that he heard Peter tell at random, and that he himself modified the accounts so as to provide an order for them. In other words, the tradition in Papias does not speak strongly in favor of the accuracy of Mark's account. Moreover, the earliest we can trace this tradition is to A.D. 110 or 120. Papias heard it from an elderly informant, and so this elderly informant, who's uh, we don't have anything from this person, but Papias says he heard it from this person. Uh, he's the oldest source we have for this tradition that this gospel goes back to Mark. This tradition, though, must date at least a half century after Mark itself was written. No other evidence from those years suggests that the book goes back to a companion of the apostles. And as I've already stressed, 
Mark himself doesn't claim so either. The tradition in Papias about Matthew is even less fruitful, since the two things that he says about Matthew's book uh, don't seem to gel with what we have in our New Testament as the Gospel of Matthew. He tells us first that Matthew's book was comprised of the sayings of Jesus, whereas our Matthew, of course, contains a lot more than just Jesus' sayings. And secondly, he indicates that it was written in Hebrew, whereas our Gospel of Matthew uh, almost certainly was originally written not in Hebrew or even in Aramaic, but in Greek, as uh, modern linguists who study these accounts uh, all agree. Papias, then, appears not to be referring to our Gospel of Matthew. Apart from these two traditions in Papias, we don't hear anything about the identity of the authors of the Gospels until near the end of the second century. By then, though, the tradition has become firmly set uh, that the books are written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But, as this is over a century after the books themselves were produced, this tradition is of little use to us if we want to know who really wrote the books. There's scarcely any other solid information available about the Gospel writers, but we can deduce several pieces of useful information from the accounts themselves. As I mentioned in an earlier lecture, the books appear to have been produced sometime between A.D. 65 and 95. On this, almost all historians agree. All four Gospels are written in Greek. Their authors were obviously literate and reasonably well-educated. That itself is fairly significant. In the Roman world, only something like 10% of the population could even read during this period, let alone produce literary texts. In a uh, recent study of ancient literacy, the, uh, the author William Harris has shown that at the best of times in classical antiquity, 15% of the population could read and write, even at a minimal level. By best of times, he means something like Athens during the 5th century. Uh, during the time period of the first century, uh, possibly 10% in most areas, in many, in many uh, urban areas, 10% of people could read. Uh, and it's quite different, of course, uh, being able to read from being able to write a literary text. Most people who can read the newspaper can't write a book. Well, these people who are producing our Gospels are highly educated then in comparison with other people uh, in their day. These four authors evidence a high level of education in Greek, especially in comparison with the general population. This is significant because of what we know from the New Testament itself about Jesus' own followers. Jesus' own followers, uh, his disciples, living 35 to 65 years before the Gospels were written, were by and large lower-class peasants, fishermen and artisans, for example. Moreover, they spoke Aramaic rather than Greek. Two of the leaders among Jesus' followers, Peter and John, are said in the book of Acts, chapter 4, to have been illiterate. Uh, unlettered, they, uh, they couldn't read or write. In the end, it seems somewhat unlikely that the uneducated, lower-class disciples of Jesus played the decisive role in the literary compositions that have come down through history under their names. Moreover, since these books were written in Greek, Rather than in Jesus' own tongue, Aramaic, they appear to most scholars to have been written outside of Palestine, where the disciples were, although some scholars would locate Mark, even Matthew, in Galilee, where uh, Greek was sometimes spoken. The short of it is, we don't know who these authors were. They don't claim to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Second century traditions ascribe them to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, but they, in fact, are anonymous. Anonymous. 
will uh, continue to call these books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John simply by way of convenience since it doesn't make sense to make up other names of other authors. The next step in figuring out why the Gospels are the way they are with a mixture of historically accurate and historically inaccurate materials is to ask where these anonymous Greek-speaking authors got their information. Here we are in somewhat better shape. Three of the sources we've already considered, Luke, John, and Papias, indicate that the Gospels were based on reports handed down either orally or in writing from the earliest Christians, and that ultimately these reports went back to eyewitnesses. Let me read for you the beginning of Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, where Luke is quite explicit about where he got his information from. Luke's Gospel begins by saying, Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. It's an interesting account. Here Luke indicates that he had many predecessors who tried to write orderly accounts, but that he himself was actually going to do it so that his recipient, Theophilus, might get the truth of the matter. Uh, one reason that has struck scholars as interesting is that uh, it's commonly thought, for good reason, uh, that Luke had as one of his predecessors the Gospel of Mark. Is he casting some aspersions on his predecessors here? If so, is he saying something about Mark, that in fact it's not a very orderly account, or that uh, by reading it, Theophilus wouldn't have the full truth? That's possible. Also interesting for our purposes, though, is that Luke indicates that not only did he have uh, predecessors in writing, but that all of the authors, himself and his predecessors, acquired their information from people who had handed down the stories going all the way back to eyewitnesses. I'm interested particularly in this business of people handing down the stories. But before going to this issue of the oral traditions about Jesus, we should consider for a second the implications of the accounts ultimately going back to eyewitnesses. Most people who haven't thought much about it simply assume that the idea of accounts going back to eyewitnesses guarantees some kind of accuracy about the stories. But in fact, this is a highly dubious assumption. Simply consider any two eyewitness accounts of a particular event. Are they ever exactly the same? If eyewitnesses were always reliable, we'd have no need for trials by jury. We could simply ask somebody what happened if an eyewitness account was always accurate. The fact that you, even if you do have eyewitness accounts, that doesn't resolve the problem of knowing what really happened. You still have to figure it out on the basis of what the eyewitnesses say. Moreover, suppose you have eyewitnesses who did not bother to write down their accounts immediately, but waited for a while, in fact, waited 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Even worse, suppose these stories that are written down are not written down by the eyewitnesses themselves 20, 40, 50 years later, but by people they told the stories to. The point is that even stories based on eyewitness accounts are not necessarily reliable, and the same is true a hundredfold for accounts that even if ultimately stemming to reports of eyewitnesses have been in oral circulation long after the fact. Now we should consider the implications of the fact that as three of our earliest accounts attest, the stories in the Gospels were handed down by word of mouth before the gospel writers themselves put them on paper. Scholars are virtually agreed, as I've indicated several times, that the gospels were written 35 to 65 years after Jesus' death. It's important for us to consider what was happening 
during all those years if we're to understand the nature of the oral traditions about Jesus. For understanding these traditions, the most important events transpiring during the years between Jesus' death and the first accounts of his life involved the spread of the Christian church throughout the Roman world. According to the New Testament itself, especially the book of Acts, Christianity started immediately after Jesus' death with a handful of his followers who came to believe that he had been raised from the dead. According to the book of Acts, there were 11 of Jesus' remaining disciples, Judas uh, having died at this point, 11 disciples who were the, the 12 of the 12, plus several women who came to believe in uh, Jesus' resurrection. And so let's say uh, 20 people or so who are located in Jerusalem. Within 40 or 50 years, this tiny band of believers in Jesus' resurrection had multiplied many times over, having spread their faith in Jesus to major urban areas throughout the entire Mediterranean. By the time the Gospels are written, we know of Christian churches beyond much doubt at all throughout much of the uh, eastern and northern Mediterranean. We know of Christian churches throughout Judea, up in Galilee, going up north into Syria, uh, over into what was then Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, over to Macedonia and Achaia, which is modern-day Greece, going over uh, into Italy, possibly Christian churches as far west as Spain, Going across the Mediterranean to the south, there may have been Christian churches in North Africa. There were almost certainly Christian churches in nor the northern part of Egypt, uh, especially in the city of Alexandria and its environs. All of this happened within 30 to 40 years after Jesus' death. The tiny group of his followers had propagated the faith to the extent that there were churches in major urban areas of the Mediterranean. I don't mean to say that Christianity took the entire world by storm or that everybody converted. In fact, most of these churches were very small. My point, though, is that some people were converting in major urban places uh, everywhere in the empire, so far as we can tell. And, of course, that continued on for a long time before the empire itself converted in the fourth century. How did these Christians in these early years propagate their faith? How did they convert other people? This is the age before mass media. We have no indication that the Christians engaged in large tent revivals or massive evangelistic campaigns. Rather, virtually all of the evidence suggests that Christians propagated their religion by word of mouth by one, telling, one person telling another person or two or three people stories about Jesus in order to convince them that Jesus was the Son of God who died for the sins of the world and was raised from the dead. They were trying to convert former pagans. That meant that they had to convince them that Jesus was special and that these pagans had to give up their gods and worship the God of Jesus. Necessarily, in order to convert people to believe in Jesus, the people propagating the religion had to tell stories about Jesus. These stories then are being told by word of mouth in different places through a huge geographical region throughout the Roman Empire, people telling different languages, uh, speaking different languages in different places, telling stories about Jesus from one year to the next. Who then was telling the stories about what Jesus said and did? Given the fact that the stories were being told in different languages in different places, we're completely, uh, completely safe in saying that the stories were not being told only by the original followers of Jesus. As an example of how it might have happened, imagine that you're a businessman in Ephesus, in Asia Minor, who's just converted to faith in Christ on the basis of stories told you by someone passing through town. You travel abroad on business, and you tell some of your business associates some of the stories. Some of your business associates convert after hearing enough stories, and then they tell their neighbors. Their neighbors then tell their wives. Who is telling the stories? Are eyewitnesses? No, that's impossible. 
Who told these final women the stories? Well, their husbands did. Where did the husbands get the stories? Well, they got them from their neighbors. Well, who told the neighbors? Your business associates. Where did your business associates get the story from? They got them from you. Well, where did you get them from? You got them from the guy passing through town. The result is most people who are telling the stories are not only not eyewitnesses, they don't know eyewitnesses or anybody who, who ever did know eyewitnesses. What can we say happened to the stories as they were told and retold by word of mouth, year after year, by people who had never see these, seen these things happen or uh, had never known anybody who did? I think that we can assume that the stories got changed. Sometimes the changes would have been accidental, as happens every time a story is told by word of mouth from one person to another. Uh, if you've had children, you may have had uh, your children play a birthday party game called Telephone, where uh, kids sit in a circle and one kid tells the next kid a story, and the circle goes around, the story goes around in a circle until it comes back to the first kid, who uh, realizes, in fact, it's a completely different story now. Uh, this is how the game always works, because otherwise it'd be a fairly a ridiculous game to play at a birthday. Uh, what if the game telephone is going on not in some living room among kids in the same socioeconomic class speaking the same language, but the game telephone is being played for 50 years among thousands of players living in different countries speaking different languages? What's going to happen to the stories? Moreover, there may have been reasons for people to have changed the stories, not simply in the accidental process of transmission. They may have sometimes changed the stories because they wanted to change the stories in order to make a point, in order to promote faith in Jesus. Is it possible that sometimes they would make Jesus look even better as they told a story about him? Or to stress a particular theological point about his importance? As we've already seen, in fact, there's abundance evidence, abundant evidence that the stories being told about Jesus in circulation through the Roman Empire were being changed in these ways. For we have several accounts of numerous stories told in multiple forms, and often they don't agree with one another. That means that somebody's changing the stories, either on, uh, by accident or on purpose. There are, of course, standard objections to the idea that people would have changed the stories about Jesus as they told them uh, in, as they were circulating through the Roman Empire. Uh, many people, for example, somewhat unreflectively assume that stories couldn't have been changed in such a relatively short amount of time between Jesus' death and the writing of the Gospels, especially when there are eyewitnesses around to verify the various accounts. But, in fact, stories can change overnight, as anyone who's ever been in the news can readily attest. Moreover, eyewitnesses often disagree among themselves about crucial points, and almost no one who is telling these stories could have checked with eyewitnesses, even if they had wanted to, in this world before email, the Internet, the telephone, the telegraph, or even the Pony Express. Moreover, we have to face the fact that the idea that the stories were changed is not a bit of scholarly speculation. We have hard evidence for it. The most common objection to the notions that the stories about Jesus were changed in the process of transmission is the assumption that people in oral cultures had better memories than we do living in written cultures, that since they had to remember things, since they couldn't read them, uh, so that the stories would have been kept intact by people who had better memories than we. Unfortunately for this view, the anthropological studies of the past 20 years have shown convincingly that this isn't the case at all. That, in fact, the concern for verbal accuracy that's behind this theory, that oral cultures are more accurate, that concern for verbal accuracy actually crops up only in written cultures, where accounts can be checked to see if they're consistent. In oral cultures, as it turns out, there instead is the natural assumption that stories are to be changed depending on the audience and the situation. And once again, the change of the stories is reflected in the accounts that we actually have inherited. In conclusion, we can say that the anonymous writers of our earliest Gospels inherited oral traditions about Jesus and shaped them into their narratives according to their own understanding of who Jesus was.
The authors appear not to have been eyewitnesses. They were living many years after the facts that they narrate. They learned about story, they learned about Jesus through stories that had been circulated by word of mouth for several decades. Some of these stories had been seriously modified or even made up in the process of transmission. In the next lecture, we'll see how this process of oral transmission continued even after the writing of the New Testament Gospels, as later Christian authors took the stories of Jesus they had heard and formed them into their own accounts of what he said and did.